I'm Kostin Raicho from University Politecnica Bucharest, and I'll be presenting together with Christophe from uh, University Catholic Louvain um, our work on multipath TCP. So this work started quite a while ago, five years ago, when I was a student, a PhD student in London, uh, in UCL, where I was working with uh, my advisor Mark Henley and Damon Wyszczek. And also this is joint work with Sebastian and Olivier uh, <laughs> and many, many others, Fabian and many, many others from uh, many institutions. Okay. I'll start off by giving a simple observation. You know, networks are becoming multipath. We all have mobile devices. These, you know, either whether they are smartphones, tablets, you know, even our cars have computers. And basically what these have, they have multiple wireless connections, each of them with different properties. So they have different coverage. They have different, uh, they give you different throughput and they even have different energy uh, consumption, right? So 3G is generally more, uh, more power intensive than Wi-Fi. Okay, so to get a good mobile experience, what mobile devices have to do is basically use somehow all of these uh, wireless connections and make the best of them. Oh, that didn't work well. Okay, so in a data center, you know, we've got tons of servers, many racks and so forth. If you actually open one of the, okay, so this is the animation that went wrong. If you open one of these racks, what you'll see is, uh, well, you have servers connected to one of these top of the rack switches and you have many racks and between the servers you say you have a redundant topology and what happens is that i mean you guys already i mean you know this all too well you have many paths between any pair of uh, servers in your data center and finally servers themselves the the, the ones that are facing clients they are also multi home to get better redundancy uh, to get better throughput right so we still use these networks um by running TCP over them. Like most, of the, uh, most of the applications today, I mean, a wide, a very big majority, they still use TCP. And what this gives you is a it's a reliable byte stream. So, you, you know, you, set, you put bytes here, they come out in the same order, you know, without losses on the other side. And the nice thing about TCP is it, it also adjusts the load to network conditions. It does congestion control. But TCP is single path, right? So once you start a connection, it gets placed on a path. There's no way to move that, that connection on another path, and there's no way to actually move the endpoints of a connection. And uh, this, is, this is a symptom of a problem, and the problem is that there's a mismatch between the multipath transport and the single path, the multipath networks and the single path transport, and this creates problems. And let me tell you what I, what I mean by problems. So here's me commuting to, uh, to, to my university, you know, listening to internet radio, right? I'm using 3G because there's no, no Wi-Fi coverage um, on the route. And as I, get, as I get to my uni, finally, to my, uh, to my office, there's Wi-Fi there, right? At this point, I would like for, for, for my radio to switch to Wi-Fi because, well, it costs me less money. It actually uses less energy, so my, my mobile will actually make it to the end of the day with, a, with uh, enough battery. So, but the trouble is TCP has bound the, uh, the, the connection to the 3G interface, and the minute I kill this interface, the connection goes down, right? So if I want to move this here all of the ongoing connections must die. So what I have to do is either manually restart the internet radio or somehow the application has to adjust, right? And this is not great. Another example is in data center. So this is uh, a fat data center. Um, it's, it's specific redundant topology that has been proposed a while ago in the, in the research. So let's say we have these two red servers here shown, uh, shown in these two racks and they connect and they can choose out of the four available paths between them Normally, the, the, the choosing is done randomly by something called equal cost multipath. So they choose this random path and they, they, they get maybe 10 gigs or one gig, who knows what the, what the links are in the network. Okay, so, so then we have these black servers also wanting to talk to each other. And then again, they will choose a random path. And what happens here is that the random choice has a you know, non-negligible probability of putting two flows on the same path and you get a collision. So what happens is that each flow will get half of the bandwidth it should be getting and there's parts of the networks that are, are completely idle. Okay. So, and how bad is this? Well, I'm just showing here the effects, uh, the, the output of a single simulation we did. So we're simulating a data center that has a fat tree network as shown before. We've got 8,000 hosts and um, what every host sends to a single other host such that everyone is receiving from a single other host and sending to a single other host. It's called a permutation traffic matrix. So it's a very, it's a contrived example, right? So what I'm showing here is the throughput in megabits. So maximum is, is uh, one gigabit. And then I'm showing the flows, in the individual flows throughput, they are ordered by, by the throughput they are actually getting in the experiment. So in theory, the factory network gives you enough bandwidth to actually give every host one gigabit per second. 
collisions make it so bad that you see the red line, that's what TCP would give you, um, and you get a lot less than one gigabit. So there will be some flows, the lucky flows to the right, that actually get more than 600 megabits. But the majority of flows get something around 400, 300 megabits, and there's a few unlucky ones that get even 100 megabits. And this is just because of these collisions. Okay. Question? Yeah? What were the flow sizes in this experiment? Oh, this, these are just unbounded flows. So you, you just start a TCP connection, you see the, um, you, you just see the throughput you get. What would you expect uh, the results to look like if you had small flows? Or if 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 all of your uh, all of your flows are small, you shouldn't, and you're not utilizing your network, you, should, you shouldn't see any any effects. So it will be. You, you should hit the black line. Yeah. If exactly. So if if all of your flows are small, this should, this effect should not happen, right? Or even if they're uniform in size. Well, it depends how big they are, right? Uh, I mean. Let's say they're all big. What would you expect the results to look like? Well, if they're all big, you'll still see effects. The effects will be smaller, right? I mean, the these collisions are persistent, and in particular this. Per, this traffic matrix is actually the worst. So you have the smallest number of flows that could fill the network, and they don't fill it, right? And this, so the effect is, this is the worst you could get. So, you know, this brings me to multipath TCP. What we really need, what we think we need to do is to evolve TCP into something that can use multiple paths natively, right? And this is what multipath TCP does. It, it's just an evolution of TCP that allows a single connection to spread over multiple paths, right? And we built this from the beginning, thinking that the, the applications that do not have to change to use multipath TCP and the network does not have to change. So uh, the applications use the same socket interface. They actually think they're using TCP. They don't know it's multipath TCP underneath. They use the same system calls. And somehow underneath, the stack just opens multiple connections if it sees fit. Uh, this works over today's networks, and we tested, and Christoph will tell you a bit about it later. And this is getting to a stage in the ITF where it's ready. I mean, the standards will be coming out in a few months. So it's, uh, um, you know, it's reasonably mature. No API changes, including the no uh, response to multiple IP addresses? No. So unmodified applications will use exactly the same API. There is an extended API that applications that do know about multipath TCP, they, they can use this to figure out how many subflows they have and stuff like that. But the unmodified applications, they use exactly the same uh, uh, TCP, uh, the, the, the same socket API. I mean, there are, if you bind to a specific interface, then the stack will automatically disable multipath because they think, you know, you, they, it, it thinks that you actually want to use that particular IP, right? But in general, if you bind to in other any, yeah, then. In other any, but underneath it's bound to multiple IP addresses. Yes, 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 yes. So if I want to cap here uh, name or whatever, right? One of the APIs got my local address or the no address. Yeah. Uh, so basically, what what you would get? So if if your TCP connection is using the uh, is, is using uh, the, the peer address, it will get the peer address on the first subflow. So when you first open the multipath TCP connection, that's it's like a that, that's the first subflow. Uh, that's it, let's say the first connection you open to the other guy, and then you can actually add other subflows. So the uh, the peer the peer IP you'll get for the for the subflow, uh, first subflow only, right? <laughs> I mean, there was a huge uh, argument in the ITF over this, whether if you lose the first subflow, should the connection go down or not? You know, Joe Touch was a big uh, guy in this argument. We can talk about this offline, right? Okay, so this is, these are all the components in multipath TCP. I'll be uh, only covering connection setup, sending data over multiple paths, and then congestion control and some applications. Okay, so how, how does MPTCP start? So we start with a regular TCP handshake, you know, send a SYN, but the SYN has a, a new option. It's called MP capable. And the X there is a connection identifier that the client gives to this, to this connection, right? So uh, the server, if it's multipath TCP enabled, it will reply again with the MP capable option in the SYN. And again, with, with its local connection identifier, say this is Y. And once this handshake goes through, both the client and the server will set up state, and basically the server remembers that it has a multipath flow with connection identifier Y, and then for each of the subflows, uh, it will basically keep more or less the same state variables as for a regular TCP, you know, congestion window, sequ sequence number for the sender, for the sending side, for the receiving side, and so forth. Okay, so if you get a new a new path, for instance, a new Wi-Fi interface, a new 3G interface, what what the client will do is actually send a join using that new address. And it's, it's again, it looks like a regular TCP handshake except, except with new options. And the join option tells the server that this actually is a part of an existing connection, right? That's why it's using a different, a different option. 
right? So the server, when it gets this, it actually looks up the connection, it finds it, and then it replies with the with a, with a join and the subflow setup. I mean, this is simplified, right? In in practice, we have some age max in there, and you know, there's, it's a bit more complicated to get a bit more security. You know, we don't want to allow anybody to just send a join and join the multipath TCP connection, right? But I'm, what I'm showing here is just the conceptual uh, operation, right? In practice, it's a bit more complicated. I'm not going to cover it here. Okay. So you know, for each subflow, as I said, there's a congestion window that you, you maintain. There's the sequence number and so forth. All right, so you know this is the TCP packet header. What we've done so far is we, we've synchronized the endpoints. They know they're using multipath TCP. They know the sequence numbers for each of the subflows and so forth. How does multipath TCP change this packet header, right? And the biggest question is over the sequence number, right? So TCP uses a sequence number to allow the receiver to put packets back in order before it passes them to the application, and it allows the sender to figure out which packets were lost by looking at the X, right? Okay. So in multipath TCP, obviously packets need to go multiple paths, so you have two things you really need to do. First of all, you need sequence numbers to put packets back in order before you pass them to the application, because this is what TCP does, and we have exactly the same contract as TCP. And then you also need sequence numbers to tell whether there was a loss on a specific path, right? So you need to know when, you, you, when uh, packets actually get through or uh, packets are lost, okay? So there are two high-level options. You could have a single sequence space across all subflows, shared across all subflows, or you could have one sequence space per each path, per subflow, and another sequence space uh, at the connection level. And it turns out that the second option is, is preferable. And he, there are two main reasons, right? First of all, because you have a subflow, uh, a sequence space for each of the subflows, it's very easy to tell which packets were lost and which packets were not lost, right? Um, also, in the internet, firewalls and proxies don't really like TCP connections with gaps in the sequence number. They, they, these will not go down well, right? So basically, uh, the, second, the second argument is actually a killer if you want to deploy this in the internet. The first argument, it's, it's more about getting all the performance rather than, uh, you know, you could use SAC to somehow mitigate that, but it's not, it doesn't get you the same things. Okay, so where do we, so, so this basically means that the TCP header must, must hold the subflow sequence numbers, right? So here's how the packet header for multipath TCP looks like, right? So source port destination port, these obviously belong to the subflow. The sequence numbers, they also belong to the subflow. So what the middle boxes really see is something that looks like a TCP connection. It just has some uh, new options in it. And the new options refer to the data sequence number and the data, and I'll tell you about that um, next. So here's how multipath TCP works. Whenever uh, an application actually calls send, the segment is assigned a data sequence number, right? In this case, say it's 10,000, all right? Now, multipath TCP will look over the subflows and see where it can send this, this segment. It typically chooses, if it has multiple choices, it chooses the, sub, the subflow with the smallest RTT. Okay, so let's say in this case, I can send on the red subflow, right? When it sends on the red subflow, it will get, the segment will get a, a sequence number on that subflow, in, that, in this case, 1,000, and it gets sent, right? So the 1,000 gets put in the TCP header, the data sequence number gets put in the options. Okay. All right. So basically, the sequence number is used for X on the red subflow. It's used uh, uh, by the client to tell which packets were lost and what it needs to transmit and so forth. Right? It does uh, whenever you know it goes into faster transmit and it sees three duplicate X and so forth. Okay. When I get another segment, say eleven thousand, uh, the data sequence number, this is mapped on the blue subflow and it will get a, a sequence number from the blue subflow, say five thousand. And again, this is sent, sent over, right? Say the red packet, the, the red packet gets to the destination. Okay, and the data sequence number is used by the receiver to reorder the segments before it passes them to the application, right? So this, is insu this ensures that you don't get uh, reordering in the, in the connection. All right, so when this segment finally gets there, there's an act generated, uh, and uh, the, the act will also specify the subflow sequence number and the data sequence number, okay? So what happens? If this path dies, okay. If this path dies, say this segment never arrives at the at the server, so the client will will time out on the blue subflow waiting for an act. The minute it times out, it actually resends the same data sequence number on the red subflow, right? And you know the connection. Oh, the connection can just go on without uh, without interruption, right? So it takes one RTO on the small path to to cope with uh, with a path failure, for instance. Yeah. Have to sort of discard or reset the sequence number. Uh, 
No, actually, it stays up and it's doing its its normal, uh, you know, backing off and retransmitting until the you know, until you reach the max uh, retransmit count and then it is declared dead, right? So if at some point, if it's a transient loss, uh, it will as soon as one packet gets through, then it's it's completely fine. It, it just it comes back into into life, right? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you, you could end up sending the same data over multiple paths, but uh, this is only a matter of efficiency, not correctness. So the sequence number will make sure that the data is delivered only once to the application. Okay. Basically, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> but your first and third motivating scenarios where you have uh, either mobile users or maybe somebody who has multiple paths between source and destination, maybe multi home to <coughs> home client, is a common case going to be trying to figure out which of your connections are better for an end-to-end -end transfer and tra sending most of your data along the better one? In other words, you talked about Wi-Fi versus 3G. In general, I probably want to send most of my data over Wi-Fi if the Wi-Fi becomes available. Of course, I can't know that a priori, so I have to maybe do probing, et cetera. So, um, so, so I'll be talking next. I'll be talking about congestion control, which. Probably repeat the question for VC. Uh, all right. So the question was, uh, how do you prefer one path over the other? Right. You know, you might prefer Wi-Fi over three G and stuff like that. I think in general, the, sorry, the question is, do you see the common cases using one path preferential, entirely preferentially, with most of the data being transferred over that path, or do you really see things split somewhere ninety? For mobile, for mobile stuff, I, I think yeah. In in many cases, you'll end up using a single path. And then you, you'll, you'll ever, I mean, I guess it depends on what the user is willing to pay for. Like if you really want the best throughput, then for sure the best throughput is using all the paths you have available. Uh, if you want to save energy, then you, you could you could look at what energy Wi-Fi or 3G is using and just switch to that, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, the technology now for mobile seems, seems to point out that you, you will be using one path and just uh, doing a handover when, when that fails, more or less. Yeah. So the path selection is transparent, but on on mobiles you, you could have preferences set by the user saying you know use Wi-Fi or something, and that gets pushed into the kernel. So Christoph actually will be t will be telling you how we how we implement this, and we'll be showing you some graphs of handovers and stuff. So in terms of policy, it's just really getting the options from the user and passing them to the kernel. The kernel can do pretty much anything, you know. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, we think there are two really cool apps at this point, uh, data centers and mobiles, and we'll be talking about both of them in, in the talk, so just hold your horses a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, obviously, we are very interested in that, and now we're also interested in this for Android, right? Okay. Uh, I was in the bar for years ago, um, uh, MPPPP bar. Um, back then, there was a constraint, and I think the constraint was still there. Uh, the constraint is the MPPCP requires multiple interface of not multiple end uh, IP addresses in order to serve a path selector. Uh, that's not true for data centers. So in a, in a data center, multipath TCP can work just fine with multiple subflows between the same pair of, of uh, addresses. Uh, the Let's say you have equal cost multipath. So the differentiating point between the subflows will be different port numbers, right? So at least one of the oh, ports will be different. Yeah, so you can have multipath between the same, yeah, the same two IPs, but yeah. Right, so let's let's move on to congestion control, right? So let's start with a bit of history. So back in the 60s, we had circuit switching, right? This is the image I have here on the left. So what, what you did is when you wanted to create a connection, the network would reserve a circuit through the network. And then if you had, for instance, this, this example here where you have two flows, each of them, I mean, they're, they're they, the the usage peaks are, are are not aligned, right? So what's happening in this in this network is um, you, you get a lot of under underutilization because of the reservation of bandwidth, right? So then we had packet switching where you have a single link, two flows, but the flows can actually use as much of the link as they want as long as nobody else is using it, right? So packet switching, what it really does, it actually takes circuits and pulls them together, and this increases the utilization, right? Now. If we go today, this is what we have today. We have separate links, each of them with one TCP connection or many TCP connections. And of course, the usage peaks, uh, usage peaks might, might be completely misaligned. So you, you, could, you, could do, you can easily see that this is what you want to do, right? And this is actually what Multipath gives you. Multipath takes a number of links and puts them together and creates a pool of links, right? And the minute you create a pool of links, uh, the question is, well, how do you share the pool? 
And the answer for um, for for the uh, for packet switching was well, TCP shares the pool, the congestion controller shares the pool, and. What we need to do when we create a protocol that can use multiple links, we need to create an equivalent of TCP congestion control for multiple paths, right? To be able to share the capacity fairly. And this is what I'll be talking to you about next. And uh, so actually it turns out that the most difficult part of figuring out what congestion control behavior we want uh, was actually deciding what are the goals we are trying to achieve. Once we had the goals, the, the controller you know, came out pretty quickly. The goals were a bit, um, a bit more tricky. Okay, so the first goal is the obvious one. You know, every time you have a single TCP connection and a multipath TCP connection with many subflows going through the same bottleneck, you don't want multipath TCP to beat up TCP and get more throughput, right? So what you really want is to be fair to regular TCP at bottlenecks, and this is an obvious one. The second one is not that obvious. Um, so it's really about using efficient paths. Okay, and I'm going to show you a contrived example, but this actually happens in, uh, in networks where the, the paths you're using are not the same length. Think like a B-cube data center or, you know, uh, something like that. Okay, so what I'm showing here is a multipath connection that uses a single hop path and a two hop path for its subflows, right? So the top subflow has a single hop and the, the bottom subflow has two, has two hops. And then I'm adding another multipath TCP connection where the bottom subflow uses a single hop path and the top subflow uses two uh, hop paths. And finally, the third, which is basically the same, it's one of the subflows is using a single hop path and the other one is using a two hop path. Now, okay, the question is, what do we expect the outcome to be in this, in this case, right? Like how much throughput can these flows get, okay? And if you think that everyone will just use the two hop path, it's very easy to see that they will, they will each get six megabits per second, okay? And the reason for this is that each, each of these will use two resources in the network, and if you add up uh, the, the throughput, which is 36 megabits divided by six, you get six megabits, right? Now, if uh, every, uh, every connection, every multipath TCP connection actually uses, uh, splits the traffic equally between the one hop path and two hop path, what you get is eight megabits, okay? This is not great. The links are 12 megabits. It should be, you should be able to get 12 megabits. Why are you only getting eight megabits? If you split traffic two to one, you get you get nine megabits. So if you, if you prefer the shorter path, you get more throughput. Four to one, you get 10 megabits. Finally, if you put all of your traffic over the shorter path, you get 12 megabits, which is what, uh, what you should get, right? So, so this is really saying that when you're using multiple paths uh, and some of your paths are congested, are more congested than others, you should really stop, uh, avoid sending uh, more data on the congested paths, right? And there are some nice results in theory that tell you how to do this, basically. And in this particular case, the outcome is that you send no data over the two-hop path, okay? Right, and the, so this is the, the uh, use the efficient path, so the, the second design goal. The third design goal is, well, what, what I said earlier is that you should put all of your traffic on the lower loss path, really. That's the strategy at the end point. But if you have 3G and Wi-Fi, you know, 3G by definition has, has very low loss because it has a huge RTT and big buffers, right? So you end up putting all of your traffic on 3G uh, according to that design goal. But this doesn't go down well because maybe your Wi-Fi path is so good that you get 10 megabits, but you're putting all of your traffic on Wi-Fi on, on 3G, well, you get one megabit, right? So that's, that's not really nice. So this goal makes sure that there is an incentive to deploy multipath TCP and it says whatever you do, in aggregate, multipath TCP should get at least as much as TCP is getting on the best path that multipath is using. So you take all of the, multi uh, all of the paths multipath TCP is using, look where you get the best TCP throughput and you should get at least that, right? Okay, so how do we achieve this? First, let's talk about uh, TCP congestion control a little bit, right? So TCP co maintains a congestion window for each connection. And then on each act, you increase the window by one over W, okay? And whenever you get a drop, you halve the window. And that's basically it. Multipath TCP works in a similar way, right? You maintain one congestion window for each path. Okay, so each path, each subflow will get its own congestion window. On a loss, each, uh, you just halve the window on that subflow. So if you have a loss on a subflow, you just halve the window on that subflow. So it's very similar to TCP. The only thing that changes is the increase rule, okay? And 
if you remember for TCP, this was one, one over W. Here we have alpha over the sum of W across all paths, right? So let's forget alpha for a little bit now. It's a constant. Assume it's a constant. What we have there is a total window across all of the subflows, multipath TCP, right? So what this term really gives you, it actually gives more of the increase to the subflows that, has a, that have a larger window. So if a, a subflow has a larger window, that means it has a lower loss. And what multipath TCP, it actually gives more of the increase to that subflow. So what this does, it actually pushes the traffic away from the congested links to the uncongested links, okay? Now, the alpha part, so goal two is actually achieved by using the sum here. The alpha part achieves goals one and three, right? So what, what it really does, it actually, you look at all the, all the path properties. You look at the RTT and the congestion window on all the paths, and then you can figure out what TCP would do on that path. And you just sum up your throughput and say, am I getting worse or better than TCP? And you adjust the alpha parameter to get exactly what TCP would be getting on that path. Okay, so if you actually solve this equation the, and the, you, you generalize it for a, uh, uh, any number of paths, the real formula looks like this, but I'm not going to be spending time uh, describing this. I'll just say that it's very easy to, to implement in practice. Okay. Uh, yeah? So They will use two different windows. Yeah. Can you present this in terms of Reno or New Reno? Uh, is this any harder with Cubic? Uh, we haven't actually done the work to make a Cubic multipath yet. We think it's very straightforward to take, say, Compound TCP and make it work with this because Compound TCP really just fall, falls back to to Reno when it uh, fills the buffer. We haven't. I mean, that's that's sort of future work. We haven't gotten around to, do, to doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So w what will happen with alpha is you'll basically put as much traffic as you can on 3G while being fair to TCP. So you'll basically max out. It's, it's as if you're putting a full TCP on 3G. You're using as much as you can on 3G. And then whatever you need to get from Wi-Fi, you get it from Wi-Fi. Right? So yeah. Uh, I mean, of course, if the 3G and Wi-Fi are, are both idle and the application can fill the pipes, it will just fill them both, right? So it's, uh, this is assuming you have loss, like you have external loss. If you're just the only one causing the loss on the Wi-Fi and the 3G, you just fill both pipes and you get the sum of bandwidth, okay? But you still have to have an algorithm for you to do a path selection. I mean, how much is it for you? How much for them? I mean, the, the algorithm is pretty simple. Whenever you get a packet from the application, you just ask what path has, has a free space in the congestion window, and you just put it there, right? Both, can both have congestion window free space? Yes. And which one is the best? Uh, then you, you choose the uh, lowest RTT one. Yeah, so, so if, you're, if you're app limited, you always put on the lowest RTT one. Okay. So let's talk a bit about the applications of multipath TCP. Uh, and I, I've, I've told you how the congestion controller works. Let me just show you now what it does, okay? And um, so what I'm showing here is a server, and we have, it has 200 megabit links. I mean, the, the speed is not important. We have two TCPs using the top link and four TCPs using the bottom link, right? And these are just customers, right? So say that you have a customer that uses multipath, and it comes and starts using both of these links. What will happen is that actually multipath TCP will push all of its traffic on the top link because it's less congested, okay? So the effect is that all of a sudden the, the, the top TCPs get 33 megabits while the bottom still get 25 megabits. So, and multipath TCP gets 33 matching the throughput of TCP on the best path, right? Okay, we add another connection. What's happening here is that all of a sudden all of the connections in this scenario get 25 megabits, right? If you add another one, they all get 22 megabits. So uh, we've reached a point where both of these links, it's as if they form a big shared pool, right? You know, we add another one, you get 20 megabits and, for, and so forth, right? So it's as if we took 200 megabit links, put them together, created one big 200 megabit link, and this is shared fairly between all, all, the, all of the uh, connections, right? So this is, this is the theory. The practice is like this. So we have five TCPs on the top path, 15 TCPs on the, on the bottom path, and then initially there's no multipath, 
finally at some point multipath uh, you know at one minute and a half multipath uh, flows start so what you see is the outcome in practice right so in the beginning the uh, the uh, top flows they're getting 18 megabit per second uh, the bottom tcps they're getting around six megabits as soon as multi uh, multipath tcp arrives you see that it roughly equalizes the the rates on all of the uh, all of those links but it's not exactly right so it's not perfect but it's it's pretty close so you see that all of a sudden the two links behave like a single link sharing capacity. Okay. Right. So let me just give you an example for data center networks, right? So there you had the problem that as soon as you open a, a TCP connection, you you use random choice somehow, either equal cost multipath or you know VLANs or whatever. You place it on a path and it just stays there, right? So instead of using a single path per connection, what you could do is use many, many subflows per connection. And if some of them are congested, you just don't send data over that over that uh, subflow, right? Uh, you just don't care about collisions. So how does this work? Let's, let's get back to the example we had earlier, right? So we had these two flows and they're colliding on that link. So what will happen is if, if uh, you have a multipath flow, the, the black flow is multipath, it will actually open other subflow that subflow will get much better throughput than this subflow, which is, sees more congestion, which will mean that the, the multipath connection will actually push less traffic over that subflow, giving the red subflow the same amount of throughput, right? So what you have in this case, you're first getting more utilization out of your network, and then you're also getting better fairness. And coming back to the example we saw earlier, um, basically, if you run multipath over the same network, this is the, the throughput distribution you get with multipath flow versus, versus TCP, right? And again, yeah. So I, I want to understand your intuition for uh, the flow sizes, again, where you get benefits for empty TCP relative to hash intelligence. So let me do a quick thought experiment for you. Yeah. Let's say I have a megabyte uh, transfer that I want to make. Right. Over a 10 gig link. Roughly, let's say that's going to take a millisecond to complete. Okay. Just, just ballpark numbers. There's some chance that, that in that millisecond, I'm going to collide with some other flow in some path, and that get, it'll take longer than a millisecond. Yeah. Sure. At the same time, with empty TCP, it's going to take me some amount of time to figure out which of these paths. Of course, yeah. I mean, if, yeah. What's, what's the number of round trips? What's the crossover point? In other words, for infinite demand, MPTCP is the way to go. Of course, yeah. For one packet transfers. No. Valiant load balancing is the way to go. For sure, but yeah. Where, where's the crossover point? What, I, size, what size flow do I need to have where I really want MPTCP? Actually, that's a good question. I mean, uh, what we, you know, our experiments so far, we had some experiments with very short flows. Uh, but we also had some long flows in parallel, and we actually saw, I mean, the effects, what we wanted to see is that the short flows don't finish later, and that you still get benefits for the long flows. But actually, a crossover point, I, I couldn't tell you. It's, it's an interesting thing to look at, so maybe in the future I will look at that. Uh, yeah, I mean, we can have a chat afterwards, but it's, I think it's a, it's a very good question. Okay, so, um, yeah. I mean, that's a configuration question. When you deploy your uh, your OS in the data center, you just tell it, you know, four subflows should be enough. And then what what the stack will do is you you start the first you start the first subflow, and then you know maybe after it 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 exits slow start, you decide okay this is a long enough flow, and then I, I should start the three other subflows. If it finishes within you know a few round trip times, then there's no point because you're you're wasting a three way handshake really. So. Um, I mean, in in general, if if you enable mal, that's a, that's a good question. So I don't know exactly how you how you do that. Um, in general, I mean, if you're on a mobile client, for sure you want to enable it because even if you have a single interface now, you, it it might go away, right? In a data center, you know beforehand how many redundant paths you have in your in your network, and you know what's an appropriate number of paths, and you just you just start it. In the general case where you have a single guy sitting at home connecting to a server uh, with his desktop, I don't know what's the good answer there. Like clearly the guy will be single home at home and it depends on the servers. I mean, I guess load balancing with the servers, if you load balance, you go to different servers, not the same server. So that's, I have no idea in, in that scenario what, what you do. So as I said, for mobile and data centers, it's not a problem. Uh, Initiator of 
still yeah, abso absolutely, yeah. So there's, there's no protocol mechanism to enable it in So I mean, yeah, but I mean, this is like any TCP con uh, any TCP extension, really. So it has to be like you know, when you put the SYN, if you don't put it in the SYN, it's, it's pretty difficult to enable it later. It's not impossible, but I would say it's pretty difficult. It would the solutions would be ugly. Um, all right. So what we did is actually we went on. Uh, we wanted to try this in some uh, somewhat uh, more interesting um, setting. So we used the Amazon's uh, EC2 uh, data center. So this is infrastructure as a service. You you basically pay for virtual machines, and we could boot our own MPTSP kernel. And um, it turns out that quite a few availability zones. So when we did the experiments, I think only one or one or two of the availability zones had multipath. Now I think. More or less all of them have them. So I guess they're rolling out new networks. Um, right, so they have multipath topology, something that resembles uh, what I was showing you earlier. I mean, I'm not exactly sure what the topology is. You, just, you can use equal cost multipath to access those paths. OK, so what we did is we took 40 medium CPU instances running multipath TCP. And for 12 hours, we just had each of these instances iperfing all of the other ones sequentially, either using TCP, multipath TCP with two subflows and four subflows. And this is what the results look like. So on the first part here, where the, the, um, the flows get less than 500 megabits, this is where you had multiple paths, right? And you can visually see that multipath TCP gets better throughput than, than TCP, right? And on the right-hand uh, right side here, basically, these had no uh, multipath. There were, there were no multipaths. And here, the, the thing to take away is that it doesn't actually kill throughput. You know, it's pretty much doing the same as TCP. It does not hurt even if you're using multiple subflows for that connection. Um, OK, and with this, I'll uh, ask Christoph to, to tell you how the implementation is, uh, is, is doing all of this stuff. So you want, I think you want this also? Yeah. OK. okay. So um, hello, um, my name is Christoph Bash. And um, I'm working on the implementation in the Linux kernel of multipass TCP. So um, the implementation um, started about two to three years ago, um, initially by Sebastien Barre. Um, nowadays, uh, while well, we are actively three working at the UCL in Belgium on the implementation, and it's about 10,000 lines of code in the Linux kernel, and you can get it at the URL uh, as shown on the slide. So um, more in detail, how is MPTSP structured? Um, okay. yeah. So when the uh, communication starts, so the host on the left is sending the SYN with the MP capable option. So he wants to indicate that he wants to do MPTCP. Inside the kernel, it lo looks like this. Um, we have the application layer who creates a, just a regular uh, TCP socket. And uh, inside the kernel, uh, this TCP socket has some variables added to indicate that it wants to do MPTCP. And um, so later, when the server replies with the SYNAC and the MP capable option included, inside the kernel, we create the so-called meta socket, which is, in fact, um, the layer between the application and the different TCP subflows. Um, and uh, the, the application is just talking to this meta socket, which from the application point of view looks like a regular TCP socket. And um, so later on, when we start creating new subflows um, over other passes, well, the additional subflows are being created and the data that is sent by the application to the meta socket will be distributed by the scheduler over the different subflows and so on. So from the kernel point of view, that's what it looks like. Um, how does it perform? Um, we did some measurements uh, by interconnecting two, two hosts with uh, each one having two interfaces, one gigabit per second. And we do one and all simultaneous HTTP requests to an Apache server by, doing a, by using Apache Benchmark um, for a total of 100,000 requests. And um, this for varying file sizes from uh, one kilobyte to 300 kilobyte file sizes. And you can see, in fact, uh, the number of requests per second is uh, decreasing, of course, with the file sizes increasing because, well, the, file, the, the transfer takes longer. So that's for regular TCP because it can only use a single interface. If we use TCP with link bonding, that's how it looks like. Um, as we uh, have uh, 100, always 100 simultaneous HTTP requests and each of uh, the same file size, 
link bonding performs in fact pretty well and uh, does get roughly twice the same, uh, uh, twice more uh, requests per second for uh, files of 300 kilobytes. So for MPTCP, that's what it looks like. Um, on the left side, for very small files up to 50 kilobytes, we get about the same performance than regular TCP. Um, why is this? It is because the first, the initial subflow, will always for MPTCP be established over the same interface. And so the answer from the server for the small file effect, in fact fits into one single subflow. And so the establishment of the second subflow does not buy us anything. And um, so for very small files we get the same performance than regular TCP. Um, but it might be improved if we well, distribute the initial subflow also over the different interfaces, a little bit like link, link bonding would do it. Um, as the file size gets bigger, uh, MPTCP improves and gets close to, uh, to the link bonding results. And with very big files, well, very big, like uh, 300 kilobytes, we even get better than link bonding because with a couple of congestion control, MPTCP is, uh, is able to better balance the load over the different links than link bonding is able. Because link bonding might uh, put, for example, 60% 60, 60 of the HTTP requests on the left, on, the, on, the, on one interface, and 40% on the other interface. And so MPTCP is, uh, in fact, uh, being better in that case. Um, so nowadays, uh, multi-core architectures, um, um, MPTCP, uh, how does it perform on these kind of architectures? Uh, for regular TCP, flow to core affinity in fact uh, sends all packets from one TCP flow to the same core. It does this uh, to avoid reordering inside the TCP stack. For example, if you have um, an application of re using regular TCP running on core number one, and uh, when the packets are coming in, they go to core one and core two, well, the packet in, on core one might uh, go through the stack faster, and then we have reordering inside the stack. And so um, flow to core affinity sends all packets to the same uh, CPU core for regular TCP. Now for MPTCP, this is uh, pretty much different because um, we have the different TCP subflows, and flow to core affinity assures that each subflow receives its packet on the same core, but the different subflows will not run on the same core. So, for example, um, you may have uh, subflow number one running on core one and receiving packets on core one, but subflow number two receiving packet, packets on core number two. And then when the data is being read by the application, it will be aggregated and we have to move the data from, for example, core two over to core one. And then we have a lot of cache misses and these cache misses kill us the performance, as you can see, in fact, in this graph where we have two uh, hosts interconnected with 10 gig links and um, we increase in fact the number of iperf sessions of parallel iperf sessions and measure the good put um, when we have eight iperf sessions the performance is best however as we, as we increase the number of iperf sessions the performance is dropping uh, even below 10 gigabits per second with mptcp and this is just due to these uh, layer one and layer two cache messages and so um, the solution to this problem is basically just send all packets from uh, the same MPTCP session to the same CPU core. And we do this by using uh, the so-called receive flow steering, uh, which is an implementation in Linux done um, by Google. And we extended this implementation so that it sends uh, all packets from, uh, from all subflows to the same CPU core. And uh, by doing this, we get in fact uh, better performance uh, as you can see the top line, it does not decrease anymore as uh, um, for the regular MPTCP case. And uh, it stays pretty stable even if we run 64 uh, parallel IPERP sessions. Um, Multipass TCP on mobile devices. Um, as Kosten already told you, um, like, well, you can use Multipass TCP on Wi-Fi and 3G networks and it will be benefit in terms of bandwidth, but also resilience, as we can fail over traffic from Wi-Fi to 3G. Um, so we did, a, in fact, a, a measurement in an emulated environment where we have uh, the top pass is Wi-Fi with 8 megabits per second and an RTT of 20 milliseconds. 
and the bottom part is 3G um, running at 2 megabits per second and an RTT of 150 milliseconds. Of course, regular TCP over Wi-Fi, well, it will get 8 megabits per second. Uh, regular TCP over uh, 3G gets the, the expected 2 megabits per second. However, MPTCP, well, when the buffer sizes are big enough, like 2 megabits uh, two megabytes, then uh, MPTCP gets in fact the sum of Wi-Fi and 3G. But as the buffer sizes are decreasing, like up to um, down to uh, 500 kilobytes, um, MPTCP performs very bad in fact. And um, it even gets worse than regular TCP. So we analyzed it and uh, looked how, why, why is it behaving like this. So imagine the, the following uh, setup where we have two hosts each one establishing one subflow, uh, two, uh, establishing two subflows. The bottom subflow goes over 3G, so a high delay pass, and the top subflow goes over Wi-Fi, a low delay pass. And um, the receiver announces a certain receive window, and he allows here up to eight uh, uh, packet number eight in the receive queue. And um, the packet number three has been sent on the high delay pass, and it is still on its way, and so. Basically, the receive window is filling up with packets, four, five, six, seven, and packet number eight has uh, been sent also on the low delay pass. So when it reaches the destination, um, we are blocked because we are not allowed to send any more packets because the receive window is full, and uh, that's why we get this, uh, the, the bad performance. Um, so how can we fix this? We fixed it by... Um, when we realize that we are blocked by the receive buffer, we re-inject the segment number three on the, on the faster pass and hope well, that it will reach the destination faster and then re resolve our, our buffer, buffer blocking problem. And additionally, to prevent this problem from happening again, we will slow down the high delay pass um, by dividing its congestion window by two to avoid um, queuing more and more packets in the, in the queues of the, of the bottleneck for example, when you have 3G, uh, the bottleneck is the 3G interface and typically you're queuing a lot of packets and so by um, dividing the congestion window by two, you reduce the number of packets that are queued and you reduce the, the buffer load, in fact. One of you guys. Yeah. How you? do you know you're blocked by three? Because your two bag is on the side. Because, um, as you can see, packet number two has re uh, Reach the receiver, and so the send UNA variable will announce, in fact, three. And so it must be the packet number three that is blocking us. But you have to be waiting for a timeout. No, we don't you need to. You already received an act for eight and everything else. And yeah, we receive a, a subflow act for eight, but not the data act. There's an, in fact, an additional, well, the data act option in the packets that it says up to how many, uh, up to where have we received. Well, can you combine the acts on both paths? Yes. yes. Yeah, that way we know that we are, the three is the blocking chain. Did you consider algorithms to change the receiver uh, window announcement or the buffer calculation? Buffer um, basically, the buffer is uh, the the receive buffer is will be the sum of the bandwidths multiplied the by the maximum RTT, and that this allows uh, basically to to run all passes at full speed. But this does not solve the problem because when we don't have enough buffer space, well, then we cannot fix the, the, the blocking. So um, at the receiver side, that cannot be done a lot at this point. There were solutions that have been looked into uh, basically scheduling the packets differently on the sender side, to, so kind of estimating the time when the packet will reach the destination to avoid the buffer pro uh, blocking problem. But basically, then you're just moving the problem from the receive buffer blocking to the send buffer blocking. Because uh, when we schedule the packets in such a way that they reach the destination on the same time, well, then basically the send buffer will be used uh, much more and not the receive buffer. So, so you're assuming that you have a real constraint on memory as well? Yes, it's the memory constraint, yes. Did you, did you look at how serious the problem is if you assume that you had enough memory where you could, say, double the window size? Yeah, as uh, in the graph, if the memory is big enough, if the receive buffer is uh, maximized to 2 megabytes, then we don't have any problems. So, a kind of a related question here. Um, it seems like you're assuming in, in this analysis that uh, um, 
a jitter-free uh, 3G, right? That, that it's a fairly consistent um, round trip time, where because of the way the, the 3G net links uh, hide under underlying radio loss by doing retransmission at the at, at the underlying layers, mm -hmm. um, you tend to get much more jitter in that. Um, did you model that at all? No, we didn't uh, investigate it, but um, it would be interesting to look further into it. Yeah. It doesn't, doesn't make any difference. Well, so it, it does make a difference in your strategy for how you cut back, right? So if you're looking at the, the strategy he's looking at to, 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 to describe what you do when three doesn't arrive is presuming that the link round trip time is stable because then cutting it in half it actually makes sense. But if it's unstable, but you're getting a lot of jitter relative to the radio characteristics, sure. um, that maybe may turn out to be the sure. wrong optimization. Sure. <coughs> Okay, so yeah, re-injecting the segment and halting down the congestion window improves, gives us then the space we need in our receive window and we can continue, the, the low delay path can continue sending, even if the, on the high delay path, the, the packet with number three is still not at the destination. Okay. Yeah? The official guideline by the working group, you know, this is how you have to abide by, you know, not to be overly aggressive, right? Because in implementation, you can say, hey, I inject packet on all paths, because that makes my chance, I mean, whatever, right, to get the best super. Yeah. Right. So what is the guideline in your working group? The guideline in the working group, they, they are not defining any uh, specific guidelines. We are, I think that's the, the next steps in the charter to find heuristics and so on to, uh, yeah, how to schedule so the packets. Currently, you can be as aggressive as you want. Yeah, but well, you get half the bandwidth. I mean, you can prefer robustness over bandwidth, and that's yeah. fine. Okay. Just the jitter question. Um, do you have you analyzed situations where, like, I mean, I know that the design of the protocol is basically to try to schedule most of the packets on like a high band, a high throughput, low latency length if possible. Do you look at situations where maybe you had two channels bonded and all of a sudden one just becomes basically totally worthless to bond to, and and so and TCP makes sense to that makes sense to sort of MT and TCP is sort of a single link um, connection. Um, basically, yeah. Well, when one link gets very bad, the coupled congestion control will the, that costing spin will then move the traffic away from this link and will prevent the congestion window from increasing. And do you still send traffic over both links, like a little bit of traffic over? Yeah. Yeah. And is there a situation or like a cutoff point where it just makes sense to just abandon the? the it probably would make sense, but um, we then we are we we are still looking into uh, okay. heuristics yeah, to yeah. find things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, um, as explained, uh, the algorithm works pretty well. Um, we don't have the degradation when the buffer sizes are decreasing anymore. And we are always better than uh, better or same performance as regular TCP over Wi-Fi. Um, so next point, um, Wi-Fi to 3G handover with multipass TCP. Um, so when you are, for example, uh, as Gosson already explained the scenario when you are like re listening to a web radio and you're moving, moving with, with your mobile phone, um, you may lose your Wi-Fi connection and regular TCP will just break and you will have to restart the radio. Um, there are applications that might support this, like uh, HTTP, you have the heater, heater uh, range extension, which allows to recover from a lost uh, TCP session. But this is not supported by all applications and it only works for static files. So like if you're listening to web radio, it will not work. Um, however, for MPTCP, thanks to the remove address option, it just works seamlessly from the application point of view. And um, so how, do, how does the remove address work? Um, imagine two hosts establishing an MPTCP session over two passes and sending traffic over bo both passes. And at a certain moment in time, the host on the right side will lose, for example, its Wi-Fi connection. Um, and the packet with sequence number, data sequence number 1100 didn't reach the destination. So what the host will do, he will um, send a remove address and uh, this remove address indicates, hey, I lost my, my Wi-Fi interface, please tear down and resend the traffic. And that's what the, what the host on the left will do. He will immediately re-inject traffic from the bottom pass to the upper pass and uh, destroy the subflow over the bottom. 
And um, that way we can hand over traffic from Wi-Fi to 3G or 3G to Wi-Fi in a very fast way. And um, so we did a, a little evaluation of this over real networks, over the real internet. Um, we have an MPTCP server and an MPTCP client. The client is connecting to a public uh, residential broadband uh, over Wi-Fi and um, to a 3G access provider. And um, by the way, connecting to a 3G access provider or, or a residential broadband, you have a lot of net or firewalls in this, and MPTSP is just able to work across of these without any problems. So um, in our uh, experiment, we created a, a modified HTTP client. And so this graph here is running regular TCP, and we do the application handover with the HTTP uh, range extension. And you see the good put. Um, in the beginning, it is just using Wi-Fi, so the good put is about uh, 8 megabits per second. And then when we cut the Wi-Fi, good put uh, will drop down to zero for about two to three seconds. And why is it um, working like this? It's because um, the 3G interface is in uh, standby mode, so in energy saving mode, and it takes up to two seconds to bring it back up again. And so you have here an, an, uh, an outage of uh, two to three seconds before uh, a regular TCP can recover from a lost Wi-Fi interface. So this is sort of a binary, like either one interface or the other? That's regular TCP, yes. Okay. Oh, that's great. Okay. Yeah. This is regular TCP, regular application handover, we're doing, uh, using the HTTP header extension. So the, our application is monitoring the interface. When the interface goes down, it then starts creating a new TCP session over the other interface. The slide says multi-path. Uh, that's, okay, yeah. Look at that slide. Okay. Now it's empty TCP. Ah. Okay. <laughs> so empty TCP, well, uh, as it uses the remove address option, it will just re-inject uh, re the traffic directly and we don't lose, have this uh, three seconds where nothing is uh, passing by. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. I would just suggest you're being generous that in, in the real world it's often worse than this. Wi-Fi loss can take 30 seconds or a minute to become re detected by the application. Yeah. 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 So it, it looks like in this that you're actually not allowing the radio to go into an idle state there in order to keep enough of a connection open uh, to, to do this, this handover, is that correct? In this scenario, with MPTCP, it's not going in, in the idle state, yes. Okay, okay so the, there, there's some issues with that. In, in addition to pulling a lot of energy from, from your mobile in order to do that, it actually consumes radio resources on the part of the, um, uh, the, the carrier's network to, to maintain you in a non-idle non state. Money yeah. So, well, so the money resources, as long as what you're dealing with is is essentially just uh, TCP heartbeats to keep the, the the traffic there, you're not going to be hitting something in, in money resources because the way they they collect the money from you is with throughput, right? How many gigabytes did you do? But it is going to be a serious impact on radio resources from the, the carrier's point of view, and that does worry me. Um, yeah, but um, we have an extension to MPTCP that basically allows to only use one single subflow at any moment. And so that way we would only use the 3G when we lost Wi-Fi. As soon as the kernel realizes that the Wi-Fi interface or the, the IP address has been lost, it will create a new subflow after the session has, the, the connection has broken, and uh, it will create a new subflow over 3G and continue the data stream from the application. But then your curve will look then the like curve will look like the application handover. But then it, it depends. But it's generalized from the HTTP specific one to something you can yeah. do with anything. Yeah, the application handover only works if you can do uh, HTTP either range ex uh, on uh, static files, and it's not always supported. Yeah. Without knowing a lot about the protocol, do you, is there any noticeable difference between like this application level handover and like an FTP handover where you're using only one node? It's um it's about the same. So you actually support that any subflow creation and deletion based on what Yeah, we can create a subflow even after we have lost the, the original subflow. Yeah. So it does seem like then whatever system is load balancing on the receive side to make sure that uh, all the flows are going to the same back end, there's a load balancer in front of a bunch of computers, yeah. still has to maintain that um, subflow logic then. In, in that load balancer, even after it's lost the primary subflow. 
How long would you recommend it hold that logic? I think that's well. That's uh, to configure upon based upon the load of this load balancer. On a client, you can probably let this the connection be, remain active for a long time because basically the client probably doesn't have resource problems. But in a load balancer, maybe a little bit less, like a few seconds or something like this. It, de it depends on. It, I think I would say it's a configuration question. Yeah, I'm just asking what your advice would be. How? Because you want to make sure that. You're, you're essentially covering the time it takes to restart the flow on the, on the, um, uh, the client side plus the round trip time for the first for packets to arrive yes. on the new, new thing. And so, mm -hmm. in, do you have any experience with this? We haven't experienced uh, in this, yeah. But, um, yeah, like, I don't know, maybe 10 seconds might be good enough or not. So, it's, yeah, I, I think it depends on, on the load on the server, and then based on this, people should configure it. Okay, so you're able yeah. to. But for regular TCP, this... Keeping timeless anyway, I mean, what's the difference? Aren't the load balancers keeping timeless anyway? Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, unless you're resetting sure. them. And for regular TCP, this is the same thing. And for regular TCP, it's the same problem. You establish a connection, then drop it, then the, the server has still, will, will still have it, this connection. It actually depends on how you're doing the load balancing. If you're doing the load balancing based on something that uh, the same calculation will result in the same pass to the back end. The load balancer in the front can be stateless, right? Um, but in this case, it can't be stateless because it wants to keep uh, the pool, right? It wants to keep state so that um, something that comes in on a, on a flow that would have been by some ECMP going mm -hmm. to server A, it wants to keep it going to server C because the original subflow yeah. was at server C. Yeah. So you actually do have a different state maintenance problem. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, I mean, if the client knew the hash algorithm, it would be easy to create. So it's a, so it's a port number to make sure it goes. If there's only one hash algorithm in the world, I'm sure you that would be possible. You don't know hash algorithm. <laughs> you don't know the open hash implementation. Well, you know, maybe I didn't follow. Well, could it be that your subflow on your creation go to a different server? And it's yeah. Completely. Yeah. That's why. I mean, in the, there are no servers with multiple support anyway today, but it's, it's this question is <coughs> ahead of its time. So what we have is a proxy, <laughs> and the proxy runs on our network, <coughs> and if the 3G provider wants to deploy it, to put a proxy there, multipath is terminated the proxy, and it speaks TCP to the, to whatever, to google.com or mm -hmm. whatever, yeah. and then it, it works, right? And in the future, if you actually support, if your server but supports but multiple, then you can probably but change your load balance. Well. But it doesn't really make sense for the, the carrier to put your proxy in at this point since it's only dealing with one of the times of the network, right? Wi-Fi. connection over Wi-Fi. Well, so I guess if it was their Wi-Fi... I mean, but they, they do... I mean, a lot of them are dying to, to put traffic over Wi-Fi because their 3G networks are, are, are really busy. So I, they will actually like you to, to use Wi-Fi if you can. But let's say you, you go to somebody like Byte Mobile that's in this business, and you say, I want you to add this to the interception proxy that's currently deployed. Right? They'll go, okay, but this is still going to only work for traffic that's going over 3G because it's not going to be able to push anything over Wi-Fi because there's no way of telling the um, the end host to activate its Wi-Fi stack or to use Wi-Fi to send service. The, the end host has to change as well when the proxy doesn't even help you. Mm -hmm. I mean, the end host, it has to, I mean, the client has to be running multipath, right? And it has to be running the Wi-Fi already, right, for the proxy to work. Not necessarily. You know, it can just work without, uh, without well, running well, Let's not rattle on it, but I'd be really interested to figure it out. Mm -hmm. I think if you have a server, call back the, the client to create some flow. It might work better with the balancer. Yeah, the server can also start creating the subflow, can initiate it, yes. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, yeah, with the load balancer problem, yeah, then, yeah. yeah. But, yeah. Um, unless I'm missing something, it seems like you could imagine uh, for load balancing, you could make the load balancer's job easier by putting in a uh, kind of a, a hint, like a unique thing for, for the pool of connections to expose the load, that the load balancer would then have a very easy job of identifying. Is that something that was discussed in the group? Or? That's, uh, that already exists. It's the hash is unique, right? Yeah, but the hash is not uh, so is unique per server. But then basically, well, we have an identifier per locally unique on the server. But then we will need an identifier unique 
in the in the data center or in the server farm. But that yeah, that could be could be an idea to to investigate this. So so actually, Jake Kuhn suggested something like this, very very similar to this in the past for how you gang together MDTL uh, uh, datagram TLS um, flows. So TLS when it sends back a, a, a cookie for a liveness check, um, he just suggested reusing that cookie across the multiple ones so that you always know if you see the presence of that cookie, it's a mm -hmm. flow destined to the same MDTLS instance. You could do something similar. Okay. Yeah. Besides the middle box, uh, how does it work with uh, I mean, low balance? Right? Middle box problems, right? We all know big problems. Uh, I was in the first couple sessions of uh, NDTCP. It kind of turned me off when people was trying to figure where the you know, option, huge option space is and very limited, right? So back then, it was discussion, oh, I mean, how do we put the stuff in the payload? And, you know, it's all very like, hairy. I don't know what is the final strap, you know, draft look like. It's just, into the payload. It is in the options. Part. It's just one option type uh, using subtypes and yeah. Right, but they all face into TG option states. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, have, we, have you guys you know, done ex enough experiment? How does uh, middle bars uh, take the, you know, they, they, uh, they look um, at, to middle bars, if it ideally uh, look at multiple TG flows independently, you know, they're all flying by, you know, that's no big deal, right? That's yeah, well, um, there has been some analysis by Michel Honda on the middle box behavior uh, at IMC uh, 2011. Yes, 2011, and uh, there's a paper showing what does the middle boxes do, how many do uh, remove TCP options, and if, for example, a middle box is removing a TCP option, MTCP will fall back uh, to uh, regular TCP seamlessly for the application. If we work across net, we work across uh, middle boxes that uh, uh, coalescing segments, so like taking two small ones and putting them together in one big one, or splitting segments, like um, we work across TSO and so on. It's not yet implemented, but the protocol uh, yeah. should work. Yeah. Yeah. Question. Um, so, when you look at like the scenario where you have like sort of a Wi-Fi link and a 3G link, and you want to handle between the two of them, I'm, I'm curious. It seems like the typical um, problem I have with Wi-Fi is like it had a transient loss of, of connection, so the interface goes down and will come back up. Um, does this handle that scenario in the same way? Yeah, when it goes down, well, it will then switch off the 3G when it comes back. So for instance, it, it, the current behavior is not to turn the 3G on first and try to reconnect on the Wi-Fi. Okay, to wait before uh, establishing the new self flow, you mean? Uh, yeah. Right. So it is a situation where they're like all interfaces are down, but they may be up. And so. Yeah, I mean, from a protocol point of view, it is possible to then, yeah, not right, switch yeah, to 3G, right, just, just wait something. a little bit and then uh, try again over Wi-Fi if uh, the interface comes up, yeah. Right, so I was just curious more about the implementation. In the implementation, um, we don't have a configuration to say uh, um, wait a little bit. So, yeah, we're not yet. We support things like, as I explained earlier, only single pass. Or for example, establishing the subflow but um, not using it. So uh, yeah, that's also possible, yeah. And uh, one more follow-on question. Uh, it seems like we talked a lot about like, sort of the server being in a data center. Um, do you guys model any interactions where like, the client and server are actually mobile devices? Um, when you have more, two mobile devices, when they're both moving at the same time, you basically what you need is kind of an, an anchor, so a proxy anchor. Where, which has a static IP address, which does not move. And there, there's a draft at the ITF about this. Okay, yeah? So a lot of this, uh, the graphs and everything talk about bandwidth. But what about low bandwidth phones that have uh, jitter requirements? Yeah. Yeah, we have done some measurements uh, on uh, application delay. How does it is affected? And um, the results are in fact pretty good, because um, and it is in our uh, NSDI paper of this year, which will appear, uh, which is at the end of this week. And uh, I can show you the results later on if you want. We have some graphs. Skype. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, we use MPTCP also over Skype, and. Um, Sorry, what? Uh, <laughs> sorry, okay, yeah, uh, but yeah, I think you got it. You know, uh, Skype over MPTCP, and uh, it works pretty well. 
we did, did this handover from Wi-Fi to 3G back and forth with a Skype call and also video streaming over Skype and it just worked very well. Yeah. So in terms of jitter, because um, Skype does not fill the pipe over Wi-Fi, so it will always use the, the, the Wi-Fi interface because it has the lowest RTT. So because we don't fill it, because of the, the, the scheduler always sending it on the, low, on the fastest pass. Yeah, um, we're working on this, and uh, but it takes a lot of time and yeah, a, a lot of effort. Is there any actual time frame? Because otherwise, it's not time. We need to talk. Yeah, we don't have a real estimation, but um, yeah, uh, it, we should definitely should do this. Um, you have to configure policy routing based um, so that based on the source address you send it on a, uh, you send it to a different uh, routing table and then uh, you send it to the interface. Yes, you are, well, uh, personally we we did these measurements or on my notebook I have uh, a script in in, uh, in the in the network manager that runs automatically when an interface comes up and it configures everything. So. No, well I just put the script in slash etc network slash if up dot d and that's all. Um, the API, no, that's not uh, on the list, but there's a draft and um, it's ongoing work uh, drafted the ITF about uh, the uh, MTCP specific API extensions. Yeah. You mean if one side has two interfaces, the other side only one? Sure. Yeah, then uh, there's a, the add address option, which allows a, a host to announce, hey, I, I have another address available. Please establish a, a new subflow to me. And uh, there's a remove address to, well, to announce when we lost it. And so basically new subflows can be established from either side, either from the client or from the server. Okay. So um, we have prepared, in fact, a little video about uh, using MPTCP over uh, the switches. Okay. Okay. So what we do here is um, we have an MPTCP server um, and the MPTCP client. The client has three interfaces: uh, Ethernet, uh, Wi-Fi, and 3G. Um, you, are, you are see on the right a traffic monitor that shows the, uh, uh, the, the band, uh, the throughput going through each interface. The top is Ethernet, in the middle we have Wi-Fi, and the bottom is 3G. So I do an SSH session from this uh, notebook to the MPTCP enabled server uh, with X direction, redirection, and then we open the application X screen server. Um, and um, basically, this application has just something moving around, and there's the 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 the, the app over SSH. We are sending back what uh, the application is doing. And at the moment, you can see that only Ethernet is being used because either over Ethernet we have the lowest RTT. And then I disable MPTCP, uh, diesel, disable Ethernet, and you can see that the traffic directly goes over to the Wi-Fi interface. And um, basically, the application didn't didn't really uh, saw any anyhow what was affected by this uh, handover. Um, and then you see that we are switching over to 3G because we disable 3G uh, Wi-Fi also. And you can see a little bit that the application is moving a little bit slower. So that uh, due to the higher uh, the because we have lower uh, bandwidth over 3G, the performance is a little bit. Uh, less good. So, and as we switch back to uh, to Ethernet, the 
it just continues and it switches back to, to the Ethernet interface. So you can see that MPTCP in fact works across unmodified applications over the network, over uh, 3G, 3G networks. And so, um, how do I switch? <laughs> the Mac button, the famous Mac button. Okay. So um, that was it. Um, related work. Well, there has been uh, uh, have been some pro proposals of multipass TCP, but they didn't really got uh, any major like PM PTCP or MTCP. There had be, uh, are proposals uh, at uh, different layers like uh, mobile IP or HTTP range. HTTP range we already talked about. Mobile IP is a good solution, but the problem is um, it it cannot. It is at uh, at the layer of three, so being at the layer four gives us more power in terms of, for example, congestion control. Um, at the transport layer like SCTP, but um, SCTP has problems with middle boxes and uh, other solutions over the, uh, for data centers like Hedera and so on. Um, so what can you say? Uh, Multipass TCP ca can be used now. It can be used by unchanged applications over today's networks. And um, it can move traffic away from congested links and um, hand over traffic from Wi-Fi to 3G or from 3G to Wi-Fi. And so, um, yeah, basically that was it. Thank you very much. So I mean the the congestion manager is the, the question is how do you how do you bundle together the, the congestion windows of the different different connections, right? So you could use yeah. that this congestion manager, right? I mean that's that's just a framework, the congestion manager. Like this is a specific algorithm, right? So it's you can you can you can take the same ideas from multi path TCP congestion control and apply them to single path TCPs. You can, you know, if you can tell the kernel treat these all of these subflows, all, all of these connections as if they are part of a big connection, then you can do the couple congestion control, right? It's the same thing. Uh, it's all these N subflows or N flows are running on so, sort of like N different paths, right? Do they perform the same or do TCP perform better or? They, I mean, in terms of in terms of throughput, they would perform the same, right? I mean, this, the, the rates are decided by the congestion controller, right? It's Yeah. So, I mean, in the data center example, right, uh, instead of having like a single TCP connection between any pair of um, any, any, any pair of servers, you could have, say, 10, right? And somehow the applications would stripe data across those and maybe you have a congestion control on top. That, that would behave pretty similarly. I mean, you, you have some caveats, but it's, it's not going to be very far off. I wish it was as simple as that. <laughs> so the pro I mean, today you can use any congestion controller, and what will happen is that each of your subflows will be doing that congestion control. What you won't get is you won't get fairness to TCP at the bottleneck, and you won't get the nice load balancing, right? So that that's completely fine. I mean, you can even today. I mean, our, our code is basically just one of those sys controls. You can say enable couple, and then it it works. So the, the short answer is we haven't done the research for Cubic. We don't have a multipath variant of Cubic. We think it's very easy to extend compound and one of my students is working on that now, but it's not yet yet. So, uh, so yeah, for compound, I th we think it's pretty straightforward. For Cubic, we haven't actually done any work. It's different enough from Neurino that it actually requires more work. I don't think there will be, I mean, there's nothing like fundamental to Neurino that makes it better to 
for multipath. We just started from it because that's sort of the de facto, whatever. That's the base. That's the baseline. Oh. Thank you. Okay, thank you guys.